we are told that Christ's favorite subject was the paternal love of God, the one that got closest to Jesus while he was here on earth, entering into fellowship with him, was the beloved John. And in all his epistles, he keeps echoing this message. Our opening text tonight is 1 John, the third chapter and the first verse. As John meditated upon the infinite love of God for his children, he could find no words to fully express it. And so he just summoned everybody to look at it. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Look at it, he said. See what love this is. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Now turn over to Romans, the fifth chapter. We'll hear Paul's testimony about this love. God loves everybody in the universe. He loves all the angels that serve him. He loves the inhabitants of other worlds. But there's a special exhibition of his love reserved for this planet. Romans 5, 8. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't love him first. He loved us first. We didn't deserve his love. He sought us when we weren't seeking him. He loved us when we weren't loving him. He not only loved us, he did what according to this? He died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Notice the contrast in the preceding verse, seventh verse. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is the proof of his amazing love. Now, why did he die? He died to take away our sins. He died because of our transgressions. He died to forgive us, to cover us. Look at Romans 4, 7, just across the page to your left. Romans 4, 7, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. When God then through Christ pays our ransom, it is that our sins may be what? Forgiven. And that is according to this verse what? Covered. Covered. God is in the business of covering sins. Do you know what does it? Well, friends, I'll tell you, it's love. Love delights to cover sin. And God counts us his friends, even though we've been his enemies. And he wants to redeem us. He wants to cover all our transgressions and treat us as if we had never sinned. 1 John 1, 9, you know it, repeat it with me, please. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins 
and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Trembling soul, take courage. Be of good cheer. Jesus loves you and wants to cover your sin. He wants to put them out of sight. Aren't you glad that Jesus is in the sin-covering business? This is the great evidence of his love. He doesn't want to remember or have anybody else remember all the times we failed him. He wants to put that out of sight in heaven and on earth. Are you with him in this? Thank the Lord. Now, let's turn back to Proverbs, the 28th chapter and the 13th verse. For well, this gives us a very important principle. That is, we can't cover our own sin. God can cover our sins, and he has a program to do it. But the man that tries to cover his own sins is only fooling himself, and that temporarily. As Moses said, be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure your sin will find you out. But there is a way, as we've seen, to get sins covered through the blood of Jesus. Now this text. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Here's one of the great gospel paradoxes. The man that tries to cover his own sins will find them exposed to men and angels. Whereas the one who will confess his sin will find it covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And through the ages of eternity, all his iniquities that he's done will never be mentioned to him. I'm so glad when I go to heaven that nobody, I mean nobody, is going to see me walking down the street and say, yes, there goes that fellow that did so. Thank God. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now, we can have a foretaste of that in this life, dear friends, by faith. By faith. Being justified, that is, accounted righteous, covered by the blood of Jesus. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we can cooperate with God. We can work with God in this sin-covering business as it relates to others. Let's turn over to 1 Peter, the 4th chapter and the 8th verse. 1 Peter 4.8. I'm sure Peter had experienced this sin-covering love among the brethren. Wouldn't it have been too bad when Peter was preaching that Pentecostal sermon that brought 3,000 souls to Christ? If one of the people in the audience had nudged his fellow and said, See that fellow there preaching, do you know what he did? few weeks ago, he denied the Lord with cursing and swearing. What good is it for him to get up there and talk? I don't think anybody was saying that, do you? Could it have been said? Was it the truth? But Peter was covered. He was covered. Covered with the precious blood of Jesus. Now, years later, he's writing this epistle. Notice what he says. Now, I'm going to read the word love here, where it says charity, because that's what this means. 
and above all things have fervent love among yourselves, for love shall cover the multitude of sins. Let me hasten to comment that this doesn't mean that if you have enough love, that'll make up for all the sins you've done. Nothing remotely like that. It simply means that if your brothers and sisters have enough love, they'll be in the business of covering your mistakes instead of exposing them. That's what it means. And of course, that means this that if you have enough love, you will be working with God to cover sin, covering it with the, getting it covered with the precious blood of Jesus. May I tell you, friends, everybody here is either working with God to cover sin or with the devil to bring disgrace and dishonor to God First, by getting God's children to sin. Second, by letting everybody as far as possible know all the sins of the church and its members. This is what the devil is after. In fact, we are told that he works 24 hours a day at it. You'll find that in Revelation, the 12th chapter. The accuser of our brethren accuses them before our God day and night. That doesn't leave any time out. He's working at it all the time. Here in this world, he has to have various shifts. Some do it by night, some by day. But as the sun goes around the earth, somebody is always at it, working with the devil to accuse the church and the members of the church, day and night. But opposed to that is Jesus, holding up his wounded hands in the sanctuary above, presenting his blood, his life, as the covering for sin. Are you covered? Are you working with Jesus to cover others? Above all things, Peter says, have fervent love, burning, warm love among yourselves for love shall cover the multitude of sins. To forgive is to cover. To cover is to forgive. Turn now to Ephesians, the fourth chapter, the 32nd verse. Paul talking again. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Be kind to one another, be tender-hearted, and do what? Forgive one another. Let's see, Brother Boykin, would you stand with me here a minute? What am I to do with you? Forgive me. Well, did you ever do anything that needed to be forgiven? Yes, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm supposed to forgive you, but what are you supposed to do with me? Forgive you. Well, you know I'm so glad I've got somebody that's willing to forgive me. Would any of the rest of you forgive me? Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Thank you. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now notice. Why am I to forgive my brother? Because God has forgiven me. Do you think that's a pretty good reason? Notice. The reason I'm to forgive my brother is not because he has humiliated himself sufficiently and uh, been good for six months, and I finally reluctantly say, well, I guess maybe I ought to. No, that's not the reason I'm to forgive him. I'm to forgive him, 
forgive him because God for Christ's sake has done what? Forgiven me. My, what a mighty reason. Notice also the manner of my forgiveness toward my brother. Even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. How has God forgiven me? Willingly. He runs to welcome the prodigal. He throws his arm around, arms around the repentant sinner and clasps him to his heart. This is the way I'm to forgive my brother. Is that right? Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. But there's more. To what degree am I to forgive? Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. How much has God forgiven you? That measure of his forgiveness for you is to be the measure of your forgiveness for others. Is that clear? Oh, that leaves no room for petty bargaining, for holding grudges. Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now, Matthew, the sixth chapter. Let's hear the words of our Lord himself on this vital point. Right in the heart of this Sermon on the Mount, he puts that model prayer, which we have come to call the Lord's Prayer. And what does he teach us to say in the 12th verse? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He's not talking about financial matters. He's talking about this matter of forgiving faults, mistakes, injustices. And he teaches us to pray that God will forgive us, how? As we forgive others. Now notice the text in Ephesians 4 says that we are to forgive as God has forgiven us. Here he teaches us to ask God to forgive us as we forgive others. The two texts belong together. They're like the two arcs of a circle. You start anywhere you want to, Fray, and you just go right around. We're to pray that God will forgive us as we forgive others. We are to forgive others as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us. Do you see? Now notice his comment in the 14th verse. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. You mean God won't forgive me if I don't forgive my brother? That's what he said. I better believe him. What do you say? Oh, but I think Jesus died for my sins. Yes, he did. He died for my brother's sins, too. And watch, if I deny the efficacy of that blood to cover him, I refuse its covering to take care of me. It is not that I can earn forgiveness of my own sins by forgiving the failures of others. Not that at all. I don't earn anything. But this is it, my friend. The man that refuses to forgive his brother closes the door to the work of Jesus and the Holy Spirit that would work in his own heart. Take an illustration in Matthew, the 18th chapter. Christ often conveyed his precious lessons in a parable 
And here we have him telling the story of a certain king, 23rd verse, who was checking up on his servants. And he found one that owed him 10,000 talents. That's a lot of money. Figure it any way you want to. The man was hopelessly in debt. But he didn't have anything to pay, and so in harmony with the customs of that time, the king commanded that he be sold into slavery and all his family and all his property, furniture and everything sold to pay the debt, which of course could only be a token payment. But the poor man fell down and begged for mercy. And the king, moved with compassion, forgave him the whole debt. But then Jesus goes on to tell the rest of the story. He went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a small debt. I'm told it was about $16. And he took him by the throat and said, Pay me what you owe me. The man said, If you'll just give me time, I will. No, I won't, he said. You pay me. And since he had nothing to pay, he had him put in jail. And then somebody came and told the king what was going on. And he called him in. 32nd verse. What did he say to him? O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desiredst me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant? even as I had compassion on thee, had pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Oh, friends, I want that kind of love that my heavenly Father has. What do you say? Every day there are opportunities for us to forgive others. And some of us are conscious that every day there are opportunities for our brothers and sisters to forgive us. What a wonderful thing love is. Love forgives. Love covers. Love is like the blood circulating in the body, in health, bringing life to every part, every tissue and organ. But do you know what happens when a cut penetrates? The blood flows out. You know what for? To heal. To cover and to heal. Love is like that in the church. Love is like that in the home. Love will fill in where the cut has been. Love will draw the wounded tissues together. Love will heal and restore. Aren't you glad? Oh, love, more love. That's what we want. Are you with me in it? Thank God. No. To forgive is to cover. We've seen that already. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. And we read Peter's admonition, above all things, have fervent love among yourselves, for love shall cover the multitude of sins. 
Do you know how Jesus happened to tell this story we've just read? Go back up to the 15th verse and you'll see the setting. He'd been telling his disciples how to work together in the church. He says, if your brother trespasses against you, he does something wrong, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. Here's my brother. I see him make a mistake. What am I to do? Go and tell him his fault. Oh, I think Brother Finley could do a better job than I could. So I tell Brother Finley about what Brother Boykin's done. But the more Brother Finley thinks about it, the more he thinks that Brother Wilson could do the job better than he could. So he communicates the burden to Brother Wilson. Now, how many of us know about it? Three or four, anyway. And if any of us have told our wives or families, then there's several more know about it. And none of us have gotten to Brother Boykin yet or not. Does what I'm describing ever happen? Well, it happens every day, friends. It's so common that it's just taken for granted. But it's not Christian. Not according to the Bible, any more than keeping Sunday is. I wonder if we're in the business of spreading infection or containing it. The blood fights hard to wall off infection, keep it localized. Is that right, doctor? And if you and I are heart to heart with God in his great longing that love shall cover sin, we will work with him in this way. Your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. <laughs> but suppose he won't hear you. Well, Jesus knew that sometimes that would happen. So in the next verse, he tells what to do. What is it? Take with you one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Take them where? Why, to the man that needs help. To the man that has done the wrong thing. What for? That they may help him, and if necessary, help me. Because maybe, it just could be, that what I think is a mistake in Brother Boykin might not be a mistake at all. And if the witnesses are good witnesses, they'll either help him to get clearer vision or they'll help me to get the beam out of my eye. Do you see? Now, I'm not going to embarrass anybody, so I'm not going to ask anybody to raise your hand. But I have two questions to ask you. And remember, no hands raised. How many of you ever did the first thing? But my second question is really the question. How many of you ever did the second thing? How many of you, after you had tried to help somebody overcome a fault or correct a mistake, and you didn't seem to be succeeding, how many of you, without telling anybody else in the world, anywhere along the line, you took with you one or two more that you thought would be helpful and labored for that friend personally, letting him know that it's just between you and him. How wonderful the love of God is. For that's what it takes to do this, friend, is love. That's all it takes, but it takes all of that. Proverbs, the 11th chapter and the 13th verse. What's the second word in this text? 
a tail bearer. You know who a tail bearer is? That's that bad fellow that's telling stories about me. That's what a tail bearer is. But what am I if I tell something about Brother Boykin to Brother Finley? What am I? Do you know the worst of it, friends? Most of the tail-bearing that goes on is not something that I saw Brother Boy can do. It's something that somebody told me that they heard somebody say about Brother Boy. Did you ever see a snowball get smaller as it rolled down the hill? What happened? Every time it turns over, it's what? It's bigger. And let me tell you something, my friend. If you and I are repeating tales, We run this risk, however true and accurate may be the story as we have heard it and as we tell it, we do not know how it will be exaggerated or changed as it is passed on from one to another, especially since God never gave us that job. He told us what to do. Who will help in the peddling of those wares? Will he? Will the devil help in that? Do you think he might be willing to put in a bit as it goes along? Oh, yeah. Another great danger we must point out. The man who is in the habit of passing on true reports of evil runs the risk of passing on fabrication. False report, doesn't he? And he certainly will. All right, now we're ready for our text. Proverbs eleven, thirteen. All together, will you read it with me? A tale bearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. The man with a faithful spirit does what? Conceals the matter. He's working with God to do what? Cover sin. Remember, you can't cover your own sin. The blood of Jesus must do that. But look. Look. Brother Boykin, would you stand here again? He doesn't mind. Now I'm going to let Brother Boykin represent the sinner. Brother Boykin's like the rest of us. He has sinned at times. Haven't you, brother? Yeah. All right. But now I want, I want to show you something. Don't miss it. Just stand back just a little. Brother Finley, would you come here, please? I want to let you represent the Savior, and I want you to stand right there in front of Brother Boykin. Just stand right in front of him. Face this way. That's right. That's right. Now, Brother Boykin is what? Covered. Now watch. Don't miss it. When I lay off to aim a blow at Brother Boykin, who am I going to hit? Do you see that? Now, Christ may be invisible in the reality. But it's nonetheless real. And while these brethren stand here, I'm going to read this to you. The Book Mount of Blessing, page 71. He who is imbued with the Spirit of Christ abides in Christ. The blow that is aimed at him falls upon the Savior who surrounds him with his presence. That's good coverage, isn't it, friend? Oh, how dare I then raise my fist and hit my brother? Who am I hitting? Jesus. But I say, yes, but I know he did it. 
pure. But blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is what? Covered. Covered, Covered with what? The blood. And the blood is the life, the life of the Son of God. Thank you, brethren. Oh, dare I, dare I lift my hand and slap the Son of God in the face? My brother is covered. Ah, but I say, I don't think he is. Listen. If ye forgive not men their trespasses, what? Your heavenly Father will not forgive you. Think gently of the erring one. Oh, let us not forget, however deeply stained by sin, he is our brother yet, heir of the same inheritance, child of the self-same God. He has but stumbled in the path thou hast in weakness trod. Forget not, brother, thou hast sinned, and sinful yet mayst be. Deal gently with the erring heart as God hath dealt with thee. What do you say, friend? I want to ask you something. Is there anybody here tonight that feels convicted of sin? Forget about this audience. Let's get on our knees and hear each heart alone with God. Ask God to forgive us for wounding him in the person of his saint. If you would like to join in this and can't kneel, you may bow your head. And I, this isn't something in the Mass, right? This is with you. If you haven't done this, thank God that he's kept you. It isn't my business to accuse anybody. But friends, I want to get down here tonight and ask God to forgive me for every time I've wounded him by wounding his children. Does anybody else want to? You're welcome to unite in seeking the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the precious blood of Jesus that covers our past mistakes. We see how ugly our sins are, how cruel we've been to others, but we're thankful that Jesus even forgives this. Thank God. We pray that tonight, from now on, we will determine in our hearts that we will have charity toward all of our fellow men. Yes. True love that covers a multitude of their sins. Yes. May we have the spirit of the Master, especially help us in our homes, dear Lord. Oh, yes. To place a guard on our lips, to let the Holy Spirit put a seal on our lips that we speak no evil of others. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Be seated. Now I wish we could sing number 592. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want thee forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Is he in the washing business, the cleansing business, the saving business, the covering business? Wonderful Lord, wonderful Lord. 592.
while we're singing these other three stanzas, we're going to prepare for our little after meeting. Any of you that would like to tarry to the after meeting, either to seek the Lord with us or to give your testimony, you can just come while we're singing these next three stanzas and take your place in the little room at my left. At the close of this song, the audience will be dismissed and this meeting will be over. We'll go into our little after meeting. Remember, if you're planning to stay, come please during this next three stanzas. Deep. After the benediction, the audience will be seated. The ushers will dismiss us by rows, beginning tonight at the rear, please, ushers. God bless you all and give you a happy Sabbath. Heavenly Father, we thank thee with all our hearts for the sweet, simple lessons of love. We rejoice that thou hast loved us with an infinite tenderness. We're accepting that love to cover us and to cover our brothers and sisters. We thank thee in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Be seated.